Welcome members to the 30th meeting in 2017 of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee. David Torrance and Alison Harris have uh, submitted uh, apologies. Uh, Bill Bowman is taking Alison's place today. Um, can I welcome Robin Walker MP and Chris Skidmore MP to the meeting. Agenda item one, decision on taking business in private. As proposed, the committee takes items seven, eight and nine in private and those items are uh, the contents of a report to the Justice Committee on the Civil Litigation Expenses and Group Proceedings Scotland Bill, consideration of the evidence heard on the European Union Withdrawal Bill and the Committee's draft report on instruments considered during the first quarter of the parliamentary year. Does the Committee agree to take these items in private? Okay. So we'll move straight on to agenda item two, which is the European Union Withdrawal Bill. And welcome again, Robin Walker MP, Parliamentary Under Secretary of State for exiting the European Union, and Chris Skidmore MP, Minister for the Constitution, UK Government, uh, to the committee this morning. Uh, we'll move straight into questions. I'm going to take the first few. Um, so. I think we all want to get to a point where um, all, all the parliaments uh, in the UK can agree to a legislative consent motion. Um, how do you think we'll get there? Uh, first of all, Chair, may I thank the committee for this opportunity to be able to speak to you um, today. As the Minister of the Constitution, I'm responsible for constitutional policy and democracy in the UK government, the Cabinet Office. I'm part of the team responsible for taking this essential piece of primary legislation through the UK um, Parliament. And it's very much in the spirit of being able to engage with you today that I welcome you know, this opportunity. Uh, the process of the bill, which is obviously yet to reach the floor of the House of Commons, is one in which, as members of the UK government, we are extremely keen to engage all uh, parties involved and while we will be seeking legislative consent motion for the bill and that has been stated repeatedly by the Secretary of State for DEXU both on the floor of the House in committees um, in the explanatory notes to the bill we want to ensure that we can work with committees such as yourself we can work with both members of the Scottish Parliament with the devolved administrations um, with uh, members Scottish members of the House of Commons I've recently had several meetings with uh, Scottish members of the House of Commons to discuss the bill and amendments. We want to ensure this is an inclusive process by which we can secure legislative consent motions for this crucial piece of legislation, which will be needed in order to ensure that come exit day, we are prepared as the United Kingdom, as the internal market of the United Kingdom, so we have stability and security for all of our constituents across the United Kingdom, for all of those businesses who need to ensure that EU law, once retained into UK law, is transferred over with the minimum possible disruption. And that is why we want this bill um, to take place as rapidly as possible and to ensure that we can obtain consent, which is why going forwards with the committee process in the House of Commons being here today, we want to ensure that this is a conversation by which we can pick up any concerns, points of detail that you have as a committee to ensure that we can secure that legislative consent motion. And I, I, I just add to us, I think it's very important to look at this in the context of what the purpose of the bill is. The purpose of the bill is very much about providing continuity and certainty um, in all parts of the United Kingdom and each of the um, devolved uh, administrations. And, and so making sure that we can uh, do that with, um, as Chris said, the, the consent that is um, being sought is, is, is very important in that respect. Um, but I think also uh, being clear that this bill has been carefully drafted with a view to pre preserving the um, devolved uh, arrangements as they stand today uh, and contains the, the mechanisms for um, increasing the powers um, for each of the devolved uh, legislatures. That's something that we've been very clear that our intention through the whole of this process um, is for each of the devolved 
uh, let's just see a significant increase uh, in its powers, uh, and, and that's what we believe will be the outcome. Uh, of course, you, you know, there is the process of committee stage to come, and um, you, you'll understand, convener, that we can't um, preempt too much of that process in terms of discuss discussing the detail of individual amendments. But we um, we do respect the fact that a, a large number of amendments have been put forward; that those have been very carefully drafted, mm. uh, and we will be carefully considering all of those and responding to them uh, during that committee stage. Alongside that. There is also the, the process of discussion which is underway between the uh, administrations uh, and the JMC process, where I think it's a very positive thing that we've seen agreement both on where fra common frameworks may be required, but just as importantly, um, on the um, respect that needs to be shown to the existing devolution settlement and to protecting the powers uh, for each of the devolved legislatures within that. Okay. Just out of interest, because um, we're going to have to do a report, um, uh, probably several reports, but our first report will, will be based on the bill, probably in its original form. Um, and clearly that's going to change. Um, can you give us an idea of um, sort of time frames in the, in, in the Commons for this? We talk through that in a bit more detail. Obviously, we've had second reading of the bill, which took place in September, and we now move into committee stage. The first two days of that committee stage have been announced for the 14th and 15th um, of November. There will there will be eight days in all of committee stage, and the devolution clauses are going to be uh, debated on the fourth and the fifth day uh, mm -hmm. of that process. There are not specific set dates for those yet, because the way this works in the House of Commons, the Leader of the House comes forward on the Thursday of each week with a business statement and that sets out the next week's um, business. The next opportunity for her to do so will be the 16th of November. Okay, that's very useful. Um, so the bill um, con confers wide powers on um, UK and devolved uh, ministers to correct retained EU law. Um, we, i.e. the committees, heard from witnesses that there are concerns about the breadth of the powers uh, in particular, wide reach of the term deficiencies. Uh, and at the same time, uh, we recognise that deficiencies must arise from the UK's withdrawal from the EU in order to fall within the scope of a correcting power. So can you explain how the term deficiencies is to be understood in terms of the powers in the bill to prevent, remedy or mitigate deficiencies in retained EU law? Simply, the deficiencies power, which is really set out in Clause 7, is about making sure that the statute book works, uh, about therefore recognising that where there may be references to um, EU institutions which would no longer be appropriate in the, concept, in the context of our membership, for instance, uh, but there are appropriate references made domestically uh, in that case, making sure that um, the, the statute books are functional uh, in each part of the UK. And very importantly, it's not about um, making changes. And I think it's one of the things across the whole approach to this bill um, is that this is, this is a bill which is about continuity and certainty as we go through the process. Um, it's not about making policy change and the, the, the focus on deficiencies in Clause 7 um, very clearly limits the powers um, to, 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 to focusing on, on, on putting things right. Uh, I, th I think also it's important to um, recognise that um, each of the powers for ministers to bring forward devolved uh, legislation is constrained and sunsetted and uh, obviously the sunset clauses are important in, in this respect as well because this is a bill is about how we exit the European Union, how we make sure we have a functioning statute book through that period of exit and um, so that day after we are out the law continues to function. Um, in each part of the United Kingdom. Um, it's not about setting how we develop policy from there on in. That will be in the hands um, of the respective um, parliaments and legislatures that will be d determining uh, what our laws should be going forward. I think it's also so important to note that when you're looking at the deficiencies that need to be corrected, they have been not only tightly defined in terms of time, but also in terms of scope. So there are a list of certain powers that cannot be enacted through the deficiencies power, tax raising powers, for example. And the majority of these deficiencies are technical. So when you look at the changes that are needed, this is a process by which we need to ensure that the statute book is ready for exit day and to be able to ensure that with a vast amount of legislation that needs to be corrected, this correction process can take place with the minimum possible disruption. Okie doke, thank you. Um, 
We've heard evidence that the powers should be framed so that they're available only where necessary to correct deficiencies in retained EU law rather than where considered appropriate. And I think this was a point um, raised in the House of Lords Delegated Powers and Regulatory Reform Committee as well. Um, so how, how, how would you respond to that and what are your views on that? And this is an issue, obviously, which we will be debating as part of the committee stage. But I think uh, there are some concerns, but where, for instance, uh, two different solutions may be possible, um, th th that does not make either one of those solutions necessary. Uh, and that therefore there is a need to have a, to, to have a power to bring forward the appropriate delegated legislation um, where it is appropriate rather than in only necessary. Because, as I say, that constraint of necessary uh, would leave you in some circumstances where you weren't able to take uh, what you and I might define as necessary steps uh, because there was a choice of two different ways of, or, or, of addressing the issue. I think also on the point of necessary versus appropriate, it's also worth taking into account the comments of the House of Lords Select Committee on the Constitution um, that reported in the ninth report of their session that it will be difficult to tightly define in advance the limits of delegated powers granted under the bill without potentially hobbling the government's ability to adapt to EU law to fit the UK circumstances following Brexit. We do not think it is realistic to assume that the government will have worked out in advance of the bill being considered by Parliament what amendments will be needed to the corpus of EU law. And that being the case, it's unrealistic to assume that Parliament will be able to tightly limit the delegated powers granted under the bill because it will not be clear what exactly they will be required to do. So it's in with the, you know, the, the context of the negotiations as well, then also frames you know, the, the, the question of necessary versus appropriate. Okay. I mean, I'll, I'll just quote you from the, that, that committee's uh, report um, uh, on this subject. Um, it says, ministers have powers to alter 60 years of EU law when they consider it appropriate to deal with deficiencies. This goes much wider than the government's white paper commitment not to make major, major changes to policy beyond those that are necessary to ensure UK law continues to function properly. So is this um, a, a bit of a, a U-turn? No, I, I think you know, we still very much see this as being a bill which is about um, providing continuity rather than in any way making changes to policy. Uh, I think the, the specific point in terms of um, why uh, purely using the necessary terminology in terms of the drafting of the bill is about making sure that we are able to act in cases where there are a number of different options uh, available uh, which are strictly necessary. But but, but I do, you know, I'd just like to sort of reiterate the key assurance at the top of this and the point that was made in our white paper um, is that the focus of um, this process will be about providing continuity and certainty. It's not about making changes to policy. And where we see there being changes to policy, we will bring forward primary legislation. You've already seen that in a number of areas where the government has announced primary legislation. Uh, and certainly uh, after the point of exit, there would be further primary legislation to make policy changes, not something um, that we see as being in the interests um, of uh, the United Kingdom uh, in the meantime, because we, we recognise that people are calling out for the maximum certainty and uh, assurance through this process. Okay. I think also to come back on the committee report in particular, they also did state that the bill itself will be an exceptional piece of legislation necessitated by the extraordinary circumstance of Brexit. And while the government may make a wide ca case for a wide array of discretionary powers, this should in no way be taken as precedent when considering the appropriate bounds of delegated powers um, in the future. And obviously, they, in the, that committee themselves, went on to recognise the uh, sunset provision uh, and the correcting power that is curtailed by the sunset provision in subsection uh, 7. And so, we, therefore, we, while these are exceptional circumstances in order to be able to change legislation in order to adapt to the legislative um, circumstances of leaving the EU, um, I think the committee welcomed the fact that the sunset provisions were in place. Well, we'll come on to the sunset provisions now then. Um, can you explain the uh, uh, approach you've taken to the sunset clauses? Why have you chosen the time periods for the powers to lapse that, that you have? 
Um, uh, there, there are obviously different sunset clauses in different areas of the bill with regard to um, the withdrawal agreement um, powers, the powers under Clause 9 that sunsetted um, at the point of um, withdrawal. So this is about making preparations so that the um, statute book is in the right place uh, at that point. With regard to the deficiencies powers, we've recognised that the um, the process of, of, of making all the corrections may not be possible to get all the relevant um, delegated legislation and corrections uh, through for that point, and therefore we would need to prioritise um, those that are that are most important. Um, and there, there, therefore is a two-year uh, sunset clause uh, on those particular powers uh, after the point of exit. Um, but the, um, you know, I think it's an uh, important point which has been acknowledged by the various committees in the UK Parliament that, um, that, that there are sunset clauses on these powers uh, and it's important that we um, you know, listen to the debate around that as to how we can make sure that that works in the most effective way. Do you think? Sorry, did uh, no, I no comment okay. on that point. Um, do you think there should be a sunset uh, clause up? Uh, uh, applying to Clause 11, which has uh, caused quite a lot of controversy. Well, th this was a point that was made to me at the um, Select Committee for Exiting the European Union um, uh, the other day. And uh, my, my answer there, which is the same answer I would give you, is that I would hope that the discussion on common frameworks can make um, progress um, so that that controversy is actually not there um, and, that we can, um, and that we can agree where the powers in um, Clause 11 to use orders in council to release um, certain areas because there's agreement that common frameworks aren't required uh, are able to be put to use um, and, and that, that should be on a timetable um, which I think is sooner than any of the sunset clauses in the bill so um, I think that's something that we need to press on with we need to make sure that that agreement is there um, and I think that will deal with that issue without the necessity of actually putting the sunset clause into the bill Yeah, um, I mean how, how confident are you going to get that agreement on common frameworks? I think it's very. It's a good sign, obviously, that the JMC, um, the, just a short period of time ago, agreed um, the key principles um, of that, and I think that's a very balanced agreement, which reflects uh, a respect for the devolution settlement uh, and a, an agreement that there will be uh, a requirement for common frameworks in some areas. Uh, obviously, we, we now need to move forward with the discussions, and I know that um, uh, the Cabinet Office is, is, is leading in, in that process in the JMC. I think when it comes to... Uh, clause 11, we've been very keen to not only state in the clause itself that when we look at powers that are currently held by devolved administrations, that there are no powers that are currently held by devolved administrations that will be taken away from those devolved administrations. That's clearly stated in subsection 4b of the clause. And when it comes to subsection 4c, of the clause, there is obviously this commitment also to releasing non-common framework powers as and when those are suitably identified. And that was working, obviously, in conjunction with the JMCN process. We had the Concordia agreed on the uh, 16th of October to be able to investigate you know, where we understand common frameworks you know, will be needed. And it, it comes back to this point of certainty and understanding that we want for all of our constituents across the UK to make sure that as we leave the European Union, we do so protecting that integral single market of the UK single market to ensure that we've got stability for businesses, for employers. And I think when it comes to those common frameworks, that's a process which obviously there's another meeting of JMCN taking place in December. And obviously we'll be willing to, you know, get uh, to work as fast as possible on this. And I think the Minister Walker made the absolutely vital point here is that this is work that needs to happen now. This is not work that we will therefore upgrade an artificial uh, boundary in legislation to suddenly suggest that this work can then be completed in two years' time. It needs to happen now in order to be able to give, I think, the Scottish Parliament and all uh, devolved administrations the confidence that we want to respect the devolution process. When you look at this legislation, when you look at Clause 11, it is framed within the existing devolution legislation. And that actually when it comes to ensuring that we respect the devolution process, we want, we believe in a strong United Kingdom, but a strong United Kingdom that can only be delivered through having a stronger devolution process. And we hope that by identifying, you know, areas of non-common frameworks that you know, can be released, that is why the order in council process, the Section 30 process that is already in the Scotland Act will be used in future in order to be able to prove our commitment that we want to return more powers to the Scottish Parliament and to other devolved administrations. The key thing is doing it through agreement. 
Absolutely. And that is why I view today as an opportunity not only to be questioned by the committee, but to listen to your concerns and to reflect on your concerns, to take those concerns back to Westminster, and, and additionally to to invite all members of the committee that if they have any additional concerns that aren't raised today, you know, by all means do write into the cabinet office under DEXU because we are in a process of listening to what needs to be done. Okay. Um, so er earlier. Um Mr. Walker, you appeared before um, another committee. Um, a, an interesting phrase was used. Um, you, uh, you described something as a deep dive process. Um, that was probably the uh, Secretary of State of Scotland, actually. But okay, yes, all right. It was discussed in <laughs> we'll that. We'll blame so. Mr. Mundell for that. <laughs> Do, have you any idea what he was talking about? I think he, he was talking about the, the work that is going forward um, to move forward from the last JMC to the next one. Uh, and to, to, to look into areas where having agreed the principles on common frameworks, um, we can then take forward some detailed technical work at an official level to begin to um, scope out where common frameworks might be needed and where they might not. And I think it's really important that um, that work does move forward um, between the governments. I'm afraid uh, I can't go much further than that because I, I, I'm sort of reporting back on what my colleague said okay. rather than necessarily something I, I said myself. We'll, we'll, we'll just take it that deep deep dive process means detailed work. I think also with the um, deep dive processes that are <laughs> that are um, currently being engaged, and I think you know it's it's not betraying secrets to say that you know there are certain uh, areas that are being looked at, such as agriculture and justice. I'm not party to those discussions, but yep. they are taking place at regular, if not daily, levels between officials. And you know, I think as a minister, I've been struck by the enthusiasm for officials on both sides, the devolved administrations and the, obviously the UK government, you know, to work together. And we've seen a, a, a significant uh, levels of increased cooperation, rightly so, because we, we need to ensure going forwards that, as I said, all our constituents are confident that we, as um, you know, the Scottish Parliament or as the UK Parliament, are doing the right thing and, and making sure this process works for all of us. Do you think those um, common frameworks should appear on the face of the bill? I think the, well, the bill um, obviously holds the power within the with the orders in council process modelled on the approach taken in the Scotland Act, um, where common frameworks are agreed not to be required to um, release areas, and um, where they are um, required, um, clause eleven provides for them to be maintained just comes back to, I think, you know, the aims of the bill really are to provide continuity and certainty. Uh, and we need to do that both with regard to the domestic statute books that we have, but also with regard to our negotiations with the European Union in order to show that we can actually deliver um, on um, the outcomes that we will commit to uh, in terms of any future trade negotiations. I think that's hugely in the interests of all um, the devolved administrations and parliaments and of the UK uh, to agree between ourselves. Uh, and so the fact that the bill provides that mechanism, I think, is the key thing. Um, but, um, of course, what we've, what we've said and you know, what I would absolutely stand by is that we want that conversation on common frameworks to move forward as quickly as possible. Okay. So one more, one more question from me and then we'll move on to other members. Um, so the bill restricts any amendment of the Northern Ireland Act 1998... It does not restrict amendment of the Scotland Act 1998. So why is it appropriate uh, that the provisions of the Scotland Act should be capable of amendment or repeal in regulations made under the bill? So across the whole range of legislation, there are references and provisions which wouldn't make sense when we um, leave the EU. And unlike in other pieces of legislation which would predominantly be corrected using the powers in the bill through secondary legislation, we have recognised the special standing of all three devolution acts and that's why the bill corrects as many deficiencies as possible in the three devolution acts on the face of the bill in um, Schedule 3 Part 2. Um, but the, you're right in saying the bill maintains a correcting power for the Wales Act and the Scotland Act. This is limited only to correcting deficiencies and is provided as a contingency arrangement to prevent gaps in the statute book. The Northern Ireland Act is the main statutory manifestation of the Belfast Agreement and um, therefore if it does require correction that has to be carried out uh, by primary legislation. Okay, doke. Um, move on to uh, Bill Bowman, has got a couple of questions. Uh, thank you, convener. Good afternoon. Um, if I can move to devolved authorities' powers. Can you explain the reason for the limitations on the correcting powers in Schedule 2, which apply to devolved authorities, but not to UK ministers? 
again, it comes down to protecting the integrity of uh, that single market, that uh, we, we want to ensure that there is no divergence, uh, that when we look at uh, EU law, there hasn't been any divergence, they have had those common frameworks, and we are just simply carrying on the process by which Section 2.2 of the European Communities Act 1972 uh, operated, and that ensures that as we then look at the establishment of where common frameworks will be needed and not needed, we have that certainty and security by knowing that um, when it comes to ensuring that we have retained EU law, that the situation is exactly the same as it currently is. I mean, I do, ju just to echo the point, I think the, um, the, the key thing with regard to Schedule 2 and Clause 10 is that this does give um, uh, important powers to um, the devolved uh, uh, legislatures to um, make uh, necessary corrections to their statute books, but it is within um, the the framework of existing um, EU frameworks and and, and uh, the um, approach that, it, that is provided by those. And as uh, Mr. Skidmore just said, I think it's it's important to recognise that this approach echoes the arrangements that we have at the moment under European law. Um, it returns to the point that you know, the bill itself is is really about providing some continuity through this process rather than making big changes. Uh, and we certainly do think that um, it uh, you know, reflects the existing balance of the devolution settlement um, in terms of allowing devolved um, legislatures and administrations to take decisions in all the areas uh, where they previously could. Let me ask a, a sort of related question. There is no procedure which allows Scottish ministers to make regulations urgently, although there is such a procedure for available to the UK ministers. Firstly, can you explain the circumstances in which you would expect to use this procedure? And secondly, why is this procedure not available to Scottish ministers? Well, I think there's already been a commitment to any, um, uh, when it comes to the de delegated powers memo for the bill, the government has committed to not normally using the correcting power to amend domestic legislation in areas of devolved competence without the agreement of the relevant devolved authority. And that's, you know, a commitment for engagement and consent that we have looked at we we're making also when uh, Secretary David Davis um, making his second reading speech and you know, it comes back again to that point of certainty and control of ensuring that we have a statute book that is um, ready for exit day um, on that point of exit. I, th I think on this point of scrutiny though um, it's important to be clear that um, we would be absolutely prepared to listen to um, any um, suggestions from the Scottish Parliament or the Scottish Government if they feel that um, the um, approach uh, that we have for the UK Parliament would be appropriate. The reason we haven't written that into the bill is actually respect for the fact that it is the Scottish Parliament at the end of the day which sets its own scrutiny procedures and we wouldn't want to um, introduce a novel concept um, without having had um, feedback from the Scottish Parliament that that would be welcomed. Um, so I think if, th th this is an area where we'd appreciate your feedback and your views as to whether that's um, something which would be valuable to explore. So are you saying then that there could be such a procedure for Scottish ministers? Well, certainly, if the, Scot if, if the Scottish Parliament decided to create such a procedure for Scottish ministers, mm -hmm. it's, it, it's within um, the um, uh, uh, competence of the Scottish Parliament to do that. Um, but if, if the committee feels that this is something um, that we should be looking at further from the concept of the bill, I, we'd be keen to hear that because that's not something that we've heard to date um, from the um, uh, Scottish Government or the Scottish Parliament. I think we may, yes. Very okay. useful, thank you. Yep. Uh, Monica Lennon. Thank you, convener. Good afternoon. Sticking with the same theme of devolved authorities' powers, um, Clause 17, there is there's no equivalent for the devolved authorities of the power in Clause 17 to make consequential or transitional provision in connection with the bill. Are you able to explain the reasons for that? Yeah, certainly. So when it comes to um, consequential and transitional powers, these are usually actually standard powers that are contained in most bills. Um, so the consequential power can only be used, this is in Clause 17, uh, by ministers to amend other laws to the extent that they think this is needed as a result of something that's done by this bill. So the transitional power is used to manage the change from the old legal regime to the new regime introduced by the bill. And it's, it's not the normal practice to confer such a power and act of parliament on devolved ministers. So when you look at the Scotland Act 2016 and the Wales Act 2017, they both provide such powers and confer them only 
on um, UK ministers. Um, but obviously, in the interest of transparency and accountability, we've sought to make a number of significant consequential and transitional provisions that are necessary in relation to devolved matters actually on the face of the bill. So actually, where we could do so, for instance, in paragraphs 21 to 23 of Schedule 8, which introduce new definitions um, and the interpretation of the Scotland Act as concepts created by the bill, um, which might have been lost by virtue of repealing the ECA, um, we have done so. And furthermore, the devolved administrations do have consequential powers provided elsewhere in the bill to make consequential provision when they're exercising their powers in Schedule 2. And that means they can make provisions that's consequential on the secondary legislation they make using their powers under the bill. So this, in a way, is it's not sort of an exceptional process. It follows the existing pattern of uh, legislation when applied to devolved administrations. And obviously, you know, that's what we have done previously in the Scotland Act and Wales Act. And, but if that is you know, a concern, we welcome to, to, to take that back and look again. Okay. So does that mean that there could be an opportunity for the bill to be amended to give a similar power to Scottish well, ministers? I think, as Minister Walker said at the beginning, um, we, are, we don't want to prejudge what takes place on the uh, floor of the House. We've got committee stage, and we have, I think, over 100 amendments now made specifically around the clauses relating to, to devolution. And uh, I am in a current process by which we, you know, we are meeting some of the authors of those amendments to discuss their concerns. But, you know, it's our duty as ministers to make sure that we reflect upon all opinions, who we value um, input for those people who want to make this bill work and want to ensure that we have a transition period that creates stability and security uh, as we leave the United Kingdom. And we will listen um, to those concerns and obviously the process of the bill going forwards. Uh, we have committee stage, we have report stage, um, but we are keen to ensure that we take the devolved administrations with us and that we obtain that legislative consent motion at the end of this process. Thank you. Notwithstanding that volume of... Uh, you know, possible amendments and, and suggestions people are making. Um, I wonder what assurances the ministers can give of responding favourably and in a timely manner to requests from Scottish ministers for the UK to exercise the powers in Clause 17 where it is considered necessary. I think, returning to my original point, if there are concerns uh, from Scottish ministers, you know, we will listen to those and we will respond appropriately um, at the point where the legislation allows us to on committee stage. I'm not sure when clause 17 actually, which day that is reached, and certainly the relevant minister responding to that will reflect all those concerns on that particular day in the appropriated uh, schedule that's been set out by the House. Okay. Something else that we've been... Um reflecting on in the committee and I hope you can help us. Are you able to explain why the Scottish Minister's powers are restricted so that they cannot amend retained direct EU legislation? I mean, this is fundamentally about the question of where frameworks currently sit above um, both Scottish and UK law um, at the EU level and having the conversation which we're having through the JMC process about frameworks. So um, it, it, it is the need in, in order to um, provide the continuity and certainty that is the aim of the bill. Uh, to maintain those frameworks where they're important, but also to find those areas where we don't necessarily need legislative frameworks as quickly as possible and agree between us that those um, can then use the order and council mechanism uh, to um, move on. So this isn't an intention that there should be any permanent restriction on the, um, the powers that uh, are held. It, it's about making sure that we have a process in place um, to provide continuity and certainty uh, on the frameworks that we have in place and that we also have a process in place to increase the powers of each devolved administration. Uh, and that is absolutely our intent. That was set out in our white paper and, and that will be something that we will continue to focus on through the bill. I think we all appreciate that the discussions on common frameworks are ongoing. Um, in terms of a, a principle, um, the Minister for UK Negotiations on Scotland's Place in Europe argued that the Scottish Minister should have this power, suggesting that as devolution is predicated on subsidiarity, there should be scope for variation within the UK with decisions made at the appropriate level. How would you respond to that? There is already, of course, significant scope for variation with the UK in terms of the implementation, in terms of the interpretation of um, EU law, as it, where it sits above us. And, of course, the devolved administrations already have um, significant powers in some of these areas, uh, but they are constrained by the frameworks that sit at an EU level. 
And what we're saying is we want to have a proper process um, for agreeing uh, how that we, we treat those constraints going forward so that there aren't sudden changes uh, which could disrupt the, the functioning of um, what is a very important UK internal market. Um, and so, um, you know, I, 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 I think really um, I appreciate that um, the, the minister has a, a different view of, of, of what this um, uh, uh, approach is set out to achieve. Uh, our view is that it, it certainly is one that respects the existing frameworks of devolution. It respects the position um, of the um, devolved legislatures to be able to have their say on, on all of these issues. Um, but it, it ensures that we have a, a process for dealing with um, the frameworks that are required to continue functioning. Thank you for now. Thanks, Monica. Um, Bill, you want to come back in? Uh, thank you, convener. Um, fees and charges the things that always interest us. Um, Schedule 4 of the bill confers a wide power on UK ministers and devolved authorities to create fees and charges in connections with functions which public bodies in the UK take on exit and also to modify those fees or charges. Now, the power goes beyond enabling public authorities to recover the costs of their functions. It is wide enough to enable taxation measures to be imposed, for example, to cross-subsidise or to cover the wider functions or running costs of a public body, or to lower regulatory costs for certain groups or sectors. Why is it appropriate for taxation measures to be included in subordinate legislation? Two um, distinct categories of existing fees and charges relating to EU law. Fees and charges made at an EU level by institutions and agencies of the EU and domestic fees and charges created in the UK for functions which UK public authorities perform stemming from EU law. As part of the preservation of EU law, directly effective provisions setting out how an EU institution or agency can levy fees or charges on individuals will be converted into um, domestic law. So uh, the bill... Uh, it enables us to preserve domestic UK domestic fees and charges connected with EU law uh, under Section 22 ECA, Section 57 Finance Act 1973. But it w w will repeal the former, and the latter will no longer be exercisable in relation to EU obligations on exit, meaning a replacement power is needed in order to make uh, and update uh, fees and charges. Um, this is a, a, a very technical issue. Um, and I can assure you that there isn't any intention to um, introduce um, new taxes um, and uh, you know, broad powers un under this area. It is very much about um, keeping things working in the way that they have done previously. I think also when you look at this, is the Schedule 4 exists simply because when you've got the Clause 7 power, that is you know, on the face of the bill states that when you look at the deficiencies power, it cannot be used to impose taxation and therefore cannot be used um, in all cases where fees or charge are needed to be updated or set. So the power in Clause 7 is also sunset, so it would not be possible to keep these fees and charges up to date in line with changes to inflation and the increase or decrease in the cost of services. And the Clause 7 power can only be used for fixing deficiencies and not all these fees will be deficient as a result of exit, which is why, therefore... Schedule Four, um, you know, exists and you know provides you know devolved ministers with that power, and it's right that those powers are there. And when it, whilst fees and charges which are set for service on a strict cost recovery basis aren't taxes, any fee or charge which goes further than direct cost recovery, you know, for instance, if it cross subsidises or a compulsory levy or funds the broader functioning of an organisation, you know, does suggest that you know there are fees that therefore need to be flexible and. Um, therefore, that power is there in the schedule. So why is it appropriate for ministers or devolved administrations to sub-delegate the power to create fees or charges to a public body and for that body to impose those fees or charges administratively rather than by way of a statutory instrument? Again, I think this is really about replicating the effect of arrangements that already exist under the um, European Union. And so where there are some bodies which um, are able to apply fees and charges, clearly it will be necessary for us to replicate their effect. Uh, and it's allowing that maintenance of that effect to, to, to be maintained. But there's no suggestion, I think, that um, there would be uh, subdelegation taking place in areas where it didn't already take place under the existing arrangements. Well, to take it one step further, then, the bill provides that where regulations under this power impose a new fee or charge, the affirmative procedure will apply to scrutiny of those regulations. But where subsequent regulations modify the fees or charges, the negative procedure will apply. 
So in theory, then, successive governments may impose large or massive fee increases by regulation subject to scrutiny under the negative procedure. You know, the concept, I think, of the £10 charge becoming 100 um, later. Why is that considered appropriate? I don't think that there's any change. The government's aim is for continuity and certainty, and it's the same continuity and certainty that currently applies when it comes to the regulation of fees, you know, as, as applicable so far. So, I mean, for instance, when you look at existing fees and charges across the UK and, and fees that currently being made at EU level by EU bodies and functions, which will be transferred, you know, we just take one example as an illustrative example. Um, you know, an example where we might expect an EU regime to be replaced by an equivalent UK regime is in the chemical industry, where, in addition to the functions related to EU legislation, the health and safety executive already uh, charges for such as approving pesticides. The health and safety executive will take on functions carried out by, say, the European Chemicals Agency, such as evaluating and authorising chemical substances, which UK firms are charged by the ECHA under EU REACH legislation. And so, without the ability to charge fees, the HSE would need to meet the costs of carrying out these functions from government funding. And this, of course, Obviously, making this um, particular example is that prejudice to any future arrangements for an interim period cooperation we may negotiate with the EU. But the current structures of fees and charging at an EU level are simply just being carried over. So actually, what we've got here is you know a sit situation of continuity and stability, uh, rather than to disrupt a process by which. You know, we already have arrangements in place um, as part of our European framework. And I believe it is the case that, again, just in terms of this point about replicating the current arrangements, that the scrutiny procedures you've referred to are also reflecting the current scrutiny procedures that exist for fees and charges. So the creation of a new one requires affirmative, um, and the um, maintenance of those points, like updating them for inflation and so on and so forth, would only require the negative procedure. Um, but that's something that I'm happy to double check and to write back if necessary. Okay, maybe there's room for better scrutiny. Thank you. Right, we'll move on to uh, another line of questioning from Stuart McMillan. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, gentlemen. Uh, certainly, the bill provides a choice of three legislative routes to exercise the powers of correction. Uh, regulations made by UK ministers acting alone, regulations made by a devolved authority acting alone, and also regulations made jointly by the UK ministers and also the devolved authorities. Uh, what factors will determine uh, the choice of the route that's chosen? Yeah, well, I think take the joint exercise you know, procedure. Um, you know, when would we expect a joint exercise procedure um, to occur? Um, I mean, at the moment, it's there to provide a mechanism through which regulations um, can be scrutinised by both Parliament and the devolved legislators. This is like to occur, for instance, where a devolved administration requests that the UK government legislate on their behalf, but the appropriate change to retain EU law is significantly significant that we agree it would be appropriate for the relevant devolved uh, legislator to also scrutinise um, the regulations. And again, this is sort of evolutionary process it's something that is not a sort of a, a new creation uh, of a precedent so for example this procedure the joint procedure has been used in by the UK government and the Welsh government for making the water environment water framework directive England and Wales regulations 2017 uh, these regulations consolidated existing legislation and implemented EU ob obligations to provide a common strategic framework for the protection of the water environment in England and Wales and these regulations were made under the 2-2 power of the European Communities Act so legally could have been made by the UK acting alone However, in the circumstances and given the significant policy content of the statutory instruments, it was decided that it would be appropriate to make them jointly so the National Assembly for Wales could participate in the scrutiny process. And I think there will be a case-by-case -case basis through which we'll be looking at using the joint uh, procedure. And it's appropriate also that when it comes to looking at sort of things like the, you know, the uh, conferred powers to UK ministers to act, we will not look, seek to take the, that conferred power without the agreement of the devolved administration to start with. So again, I come back, you know, to this point of this is the UK government, you know, on the one hand, wanting to ensure that while we take retained EU legislation forwards until we can understand where the common frameworks need to exist and where we can further provide uh, areas uh, to strengthen the devolution settlement, while that process is ongoing, when it comes to issues of retained EU law where Traditionally, there would have been a UK-wide uh, operating framework. If we can work together with our devolved administrations, we'll do so both in terms of where conferred powers are needed by 
asking for permission and to try and agree to, to get acceptance of that, but also secondly, when it comes to the joint procedure. And obviously that's a subject case by case, I said, of, of understanding where those significant issues arise. And certainly what role would you envisage the Scottish Parliament uh, might actually have in the decisions to proceed with the joint power? And also certainly with these decisions and that the, that the UK government should actually act alone and should exercise, should exercise their powers in devolved areas. Well, I think when it comes to the Scottish Parliament, I mean, the bill's explicit that um, we've provided it for it to be in the legislative competence of the Scottish Parliament to you know, change the arrangements when it comes to scrutiny. And uh, we want to ensure that the scrutiny arrangements that are available for the Scottish Parliament obviously be decided by the Scottish Parliament and also with the uh, devolved administration, the Scottish Government. But we want to ensure that the Scottish Government is able to come up with its own arrangements you know, for scrutiny going forwards you know, on these issues. I mean, following on from that then, I mean, the bill doesn't provide for any mechanism uh, for the Scottish Parliament's scrutiny of regulations made by the UK ministers acting alone, irrespective as to whether the, the regulations are a matter of significance for Scotland or would have attracted the benefit of the Sewell Convention uh, had the matter been included in primary legislation. Uh, can you explain why that's the case, please? Well, I think the, the, the key point here is to set out as a bill. This is just simply the equivalent scrutiny procedures that apply in the devolved legislatures as they apply in the, the UK Parliament. And we've um, invited comments from the Scottish Government on their views, the appropriateness of the scrutiny arrangements in the bill. But when it comes to defining scrutiny and providing those procedures, obviously it's an integral part of creating a secondary legislation power. And if we don't have a scrutiny procedure that's uh, specified when that power is created. The legal position is that power can be exercised by the relevant authority by simply making the instrument without any oversight for a role for legislature. That we believe would be unorthodox and irresponsible, uh, which is why you know we have created scrutiny provisions in the bill to ensure that the Scottish Parliament can provide for scrutiny and use of the powers. But we recognise the flexibility there that the Scottish Parliament at a later stage may wish to adapt those scrutiny procedures. And I sat as a uh, government minister, I took through the uh, Digital Economy Act um, last year. And just to sort of, you know, give again an evolutionary principle by which we have taken forward and added into Schedule 7, you know, the sort of framework by which scrutiny should take place. The Digital Economy Act in 2017 conferred a number of new powers on Scottish ministers and sets out the procedures for the Scottish Parliament's scrutiny of those powers. Um, in its report as part of the LCM process, the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee commented on those procedures, but at no point questioned the appropriateness of the inclusion of the procedures in that bill. So when it comes to scrutiny, yes, we have applied a process of several different kinds of you know, resolutions, whether affirmative, whether negative, um, and whether made affirmative, um, but we want to ensure that going forward we work with the Scottish Government and obviously with the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish Government works with the Scottish Parliament in order to understand that you know, we recognise the Scottish Parliament does have different scrutiny procedures and technicalities that obviously want to be reflected in your own ability to scrutinise uh, future uh, delegated legislation regulations, but we want to ensure that going forwards with the bill, and I think you can see this throughout the entire process of how the bill has been framed. This is about continuity and stability and certainty, which is why we have taken existing frameworks and existing legislation. We've not looked to create sort of new constitutional contexts here. This bill is a process bill by which we need to ensure that this statute book is it remains um, applicable on exit day, which is why we have taken forward um, processes that had already existed in order to ensure there was the minimum degree of change and maximum degree of stability. I mean, one aspect regarding that, I, mean, I didn't hear uh, the issue of either agreement or consent with the Scottish ministers being mentioned in your reply, Mr Skidmore. And certainly with the Delegated Powers Memorandum, now that states that the UK government will not normally use the power yes. to amend domestic legislation in areas of devolved competence without the agreement of the relevant devolved authority. And I'm certainly very interested to understand uh, more in terms of what the word normally actually means in that particular phrase. Well, I think MBC writes, you know, it's in the delegated powers member. I quoted that previously early uh, in the session, and obviously 
Uh, David Davis wrote to Mike Russell and Mark Drakeford on the 13th of July, stating, I will commit at second reading that the government will not use these powers to amend such legislation without first consulting you, and I've placed such commitment in the bill's explanatory notes. And in second reading, he stated that the government committed to ensuring the powers work for administrations and legislators. For instance, I've already confirmed that we will always consult the administrations on corrections made to direct EU law relating to otherwise devolved areas of competence. And we're determined to ensure that that engagement takes place and that we can ensure that when we take forward uh, legislation that we can uh, reach a process by which um, we are able um, you know, to have that consultation process. Uh, certainly, the, the views of this committee uh, are listened to certainly within the, this parliament and also with other committees. Uh, but certainly, how can the views of this committee and those of the Scottish Parliament as a whole actually be fed into the scrutiny of the statutory instruments in Westminster? Well, I think first and foremost, we have a process now by which we are legislating on the EU withdrawal bill. The bill, as it exists in its current form, is obviously subject to the committee stage and the report stage of the House of Commons. We want a bill that works for the whole of the United Kingdom, that works for the devolved administrations, that is able to receive legislative consent from the devolved administrations. And we want to work with you first and foremost at making sure we get the bill right and that we take the confidence of the Scottish Parliament and the devolved administrations with us on that process. So I think first and foremost, you know, we're here today to listen and we look forward, I think, to the committee's uh, report which feeds into the interim report of the finance and constitution committee which i think is out on the i believe the 23rd of november i will be reading that closely but i give you a commitment that you know the work of this committee will be looked at closely by ministers both in the cabin office and in dexu in order to ensure that we have a bill that works for the devolved administrations in the united kingdom follow up to that line and then you should come in with your okay. final question um so what you know, when you, you're talking about um, using um, the power to amend domestic legislation uh, in areas of devolved competence and, and you want to work with uh, the Scottish Government, um, but what, what if you wanted to do something and they didn't agree to it? What, what happens then? Well, I think, again, when you, you look at the bill and you look at, for instance, you know, Clause 11, like I said, you know, when you look at 4C, the order in council process, we put on the face of a bill a commitment to ensure that when it comes to having established what common frameworks are, that we can then use the Section 30 order of the Scotland Act to be able to provide further powers using the existing reserve powers model in order to strengthen the devolution process. You know, I want to ensure that this legislation is seen as a process. This legislation is absolutely necessary and crucial for, un for ensuring that our legislative book when we exit the European Union is correct and is not deficient. That is the purpose of this bill. The bill is not t to seek to redefine our constitutional processes, which is why it has been established on the basis of the devolution settlements and successive devolution settlements. And any reassurances, ministers, that we can provide, uh, w we will go away from this committee and reflect upon. Okay. Uh, certainly, um, this morning uh, in this session, uh, there has been a lot of positive comment, which I do welcome regarding uh, try, well, trying to get to uh, a successful outcome uh, for the, the four nations within uh, the UK and some of the comments this morning, uh, uh, Mr Skidmore, you spoke about the stability and security, also in the, in the, in the process of listening to what needs to be done. And uh, on Thursday in the European Committee, the Secretary of State for Scotland, Mr Mandel, spoke of wanting to have a united and cohesive approach. And certainly scrutiny is absolutely cru crucial in this and key to this. And the, the GMC process, which has been touched upon by yourselves this morning, uh, certainly not been uh, a process that has been uh, fully, um, fully, well, it's not been working uh, the way it really sh certainly should be. And I mean, this morning, uh, Mr. Mandel, in the, in the earlier session, spoke of the, the, the intergovernmental relations needs to, needs to do more, it needs to improve. With that, I mean, what, I mean, what uh, would you, now we're saying, what would the UK government like to do uh, and, and how do you see the, the whole IGR process actually improving uh, to allow uh, not just the, the, the two governments and, and, and certainly the three governments uh, at the moment within the UK to actually have a better process, but also to allow uh, certainly the likes of this committee and also 
uh, this Parliament to have uh, a, a better input uh, and a greater input uh, into the process. I mean, uh, pro pro probably a lot of this fits within Chris's area, so I'll let him expand on this. But m I think from the perspective of our department, we've recognised very much from the start of this process that there is a really important intergovernmental conversation to be having around this process, that we need to be um, engaging um, with um, the, the First Ministers, the, the, the relevant European Ministers. Of course, we've been, um, uh, there's been a lot of direct contact between David Davis and Mike Russell, um, and uh, we, we need to take that forward both through the JMC process and bilaterally. And I think it's important to recognise that even whilst the JMC was not meeting for much of this year, there was a lot of direct bilateral contact going on between ministers. Um, I welcome the fact that the JMC has now reconvened. And I think in its new format, we've seen very welcome progress um, with the, um, the statement on joint principles um, coming out of that. Um, but we are very clear that um, you know, we need to keep working at this. We need to make sure that we continue to lean into um, the relationship with each of the devolved administrations and of course in that respect we would really like to have um, an executive in place in Northern Ireland to be able to uh, do, do that with because um, at the moment we can deal directly with ministers um, in Scotland and in Wales um, but not in uh, the Northern Ireland context and that is certainly a, um, a problem. So it would be good to get beyond that, it would be good to be able to, t to, to take that forward and I can you know, both as the, the minister responsible, but also knowing how seriously my secretary of state takes this, this is a major, major priority for us. Um, but I know that the cabinet office is obviously leading on that cross-government work, and so Chris may want to add on that front. I think you know, it's important to reflect on that post the uh, vote in 2016, the consequential effect of this has been, you know, a necessary strengthening of that intergovernmental process, not only in terms of the. Uh, number of occasions by which we can ensure that the JMC process is enacted, not just JMCN, because obviously that equally feeds into JMCP, but at the same time, looking at ensuring we have you know stronger working, we have you know, an opportunity here that reflecting upon the union and our understanding that we need to protect the single market that we operate within the UK, you know, for the livelihood of businesses across every border, at the same time, when it comes to um, you know, not only working together and creating those that strong bonds of cooperation, we reflect upon the fact that uh, a strong union is only as strong as the devolution settlement that underpins it. And I passionately believe that when it comes to ensuring we have a, a union that is fit for the 21st century, the rights and responsibilities that are reflected in devolution settlements when it comes to understanding sort of where we may be able to devolve further powers. That commitment is here in this bill and it will begin a process by which the common frameworks arrangements and those discussions will continue and the Concordia that was agreed on the 16th of, of uh, October was a huge step forwards in cross intergovernmental inter working. So I'm very positive at the commitments of all the um, administrations, uh, UK government, Scottish government, Welsh government have made to work together because we recognise that we have a duty and a responsibility to ensure that our legislation works. I mean, so just on that aspect as well then, um, so, I mean, the convener posed a question earlier regarding the, the common frameworks and it has been touched upon by yourselves this morning and that clearly was an issue that was discussed in the, in the, the Constitution Committee uh, this morning too. And uh, the convener uh, of that committee posed the question of uh, should the, these common frameworks then be placed on the face of the bill because they are so important and in the whole issue of scrutiny of these frameworks should they not have that importance of actually being placed upon the bill? Yeah, I, I think I've already tried, tried to answer that question. I think, uh, but, but, but I think the way in which the bill deals with this, given that that process is, is running alongside the process of this bill, um, is to um, create, uh, to, to have the powers within the Orders and Council mechanism, um, specifically for releasing powers where common frameworks aren't required, um, and w within Clause 11, uh, to have the ability to maintain them where they are required. Um, but I do recognise, and I think we all recognise, the importance of moving forward with that discussion on common frameworks in a timetable, uh, which will help to define the scope of that clause within this bill. Uh, and I think that is something that I discussed with the Constitution Committee earlier. We're, we're clear that that will, I think, have some bearing 
uh, on people's understanding of the scope of Clause 11. But certainly the detail, uh, so the detail of, uh, of the issue of the frameworks um, is absolutely crucial for that wider scrutiny as well, not just certainly within the Parliament, but certainly for uh, external organisations, particularly mm. uh, when it comes to the business interests. Because I think I accept the comments made earlier this morning in terms of the, the economic uh, impact that when we do now when we do leave the EU uh, to have a, as less of a negative impact as possible. So I think that that issue is absolutely crucial in terms of making sure that more people, about well, well, the whole of the population, actually are aware of what the details actually are. And uh, my final question, if I may, convener, um, is just it's regarding the uh, just you know, on that particular area. Um, it's it is once again just regarding uh, the issue of uh, scrutiny uh, and uh, in terms of information that that uh, that is uh, available. Um, th there has been the, the discussion uh, and the issue of the, the, the 58 um, papers uh, and as to whether they do exist or don't exist or the details of these papers as to whether they do or don't exist and the, and the, 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 the details of, uh, of, these, uh, of these anal this uh, economic analysis and the, of the sectoral analysis. Uh, and this came up obviously this morning in your previous committee but also came up in the European Committee uh, here uh, on Thursday of last week. And, but, in terms of the, the details of them, um, can you provide some clarity as to what the situation actually is regarding these papers? Do they exist? I think the most straightforward thing we should do is refer you to the written ministerial statement that was posted um, by our department earlier this week, which set out some of this detail. I also discussed some of these things in a debate in the House of Commons the previous week when we were debating the original opposition uh, motion on this front. What we, what we said is that the information does not exist in the form that it has been asked for, in the form of you know, 58 economic impact assessments, um, which the, um, the motion referred to. But we have also said that there is a sectoral, sectoral analysis. Uh, and just to quote my colleague um, uh, Steve Baker yesterday in the debate, the sectoral analysis has been discussed with the devolved administrations and the Joint Ministerial Committee, and we will give careful consideration as and when the information is released to the Select Committee to how we share that information with the devolved administrations. So that's something which which I reiterated um, uh, uh, earlier on um, in my evidence to the Finance and Constitution Committee. There are, as I made clear in my speech to the Commons debate, some legal constraints on ministers in terms of the information that we can release, um, and we have to operate within those legal constraints. And of course, because the specific motion that we're dealing with um, asked us to refer information to a select committee, we do need to make sure that we've agreed the terms um, on which information will be released with that select committee first and foremost. But I think, as my, my colleague said, we will um, give careful consideration to how that information can then be shared. I mean, certainly could our committee uh, actually have, um, if there's any, any aspects of that where there could be some type of delegated uh, power aspect or certainly some in terms of scrutiny, mm. uh, could this committee actually be considered to, uh, to have that information also? Well, I certainly take note of that, but I think just, you know, the, the analysis we're talking about is sectoral analysis mm -hmm. uh, across the UK economy. So I'm not, I'm not sure that would necessarily be a relevant consideration, but I will certainly take note of that. And, and, and if that is the case, we will come back to you. Okay, thank you. Okay. okay. Um, right, just a, just a couple of questions on, on scrutiny. Um, so Schedule 7 uh, lists specific provisions which, if included in secondary legislation, were required to be subject to the affirmative procedure. Um, so how did you choose the categories? And is there any scope for including additional ones? I think when it comes to the affirmative procedure for Clause 7, you know, we have establishing a new uh, public authority, uh, transferring functions uh, to newly created public authorities, transferring EU legislative powers, i.e. powers to make delegated or implementing acts to a UK body, uh, if it relates to fees, uh, creating or amending criminal offences, and creating or amending uh, power to legislate. And when it comes to those restrictions on what could be used the affirmative procedure, uh, what can be used as the negative procedure, I mean, that sort of does also reflect some of the restrictions that are there also in Clause 7 as well. So in terms of, you know, the understanding that when it 
we come forward to take forward the secondary legislation or regulations that, that we have that scrutiny and the affirmative procedure in place absolutely you know it's a commitment to ensuring the legislators have that ability to be able and parliament has that ability to be able to monitor effectively the processes that are taking place yeah. i think just the other point i'd just add in terms of scrutiny is it's important that you know, the bill um as a, a a bill before the uk parliament sets out a scrutiny procedure um for the uk parliament it echoes that um for the approach in the devolved um parliaments but we are very clear but at the end of the day, control of scrutiny procedures in the devolved parliaments is for the devolved parliaments themselves. Uh, and so that is something that um, certainly, um, if the devolved parliaments want to take an approach to um, yeah. taking a, uh, setting out an uh, approach to scrutiny at their level, which is different to that set out in the bill, they're absolutely empowered to do so. Okay. Well, we explored this um, when, when we, we had Mr. Russell in front of us and uh, actually discussed the possibility of coming up with a bespoke procedure. Um, might want to think about that for the UK Parliament. We'd be very interested to see your suggestions on that front. Okay, lovely. Um, Monica? Thanks, Convener. Yeah, I just wanted to finish up on um, engagement, which links into what Sean McMillan's been asking, I suppose, around scrutiny. Um, I'm aware there's a, a high volume of amendments and clauses, and that might just be MPs doing their job well, but I think there's a feeling that there wasn't enough effective consultation with, sta with stakeholders during the drafting of the bill. This committee's heard from some stakeholders about the need for early engagement on consultation drafts of regulations to be made under this bill. And there's been a strong emphasis on how important it is for stakeholders and, of course, Parliament to have opportunities to propose amendments to draft legislation. To address some of these concerns, I'm not sure if the ministers recognise them, but do, do the ministers consider that there is scope for strength and scrutiny in some areas along the lines of a super affirmative procedure? So, I mean, broadly in terms of um, engagement, I think there has been a huge amount of engagement around this bill. We published a white paper um, and we have um, been engaging uh, you know, up and down the United Kingdom uh, around the whole approach to um, our EU exit. But within that uh, on this bill. This bill was, the approach set out in this bill, focusing on certainty and continuity, was very much a response to what we had been hearing from stakeholders uh, about the importance of these matters. And that's something, again, which is set out in the government strategy, um, but, that is, uh, but we constantly hear about the need for providing the maximum certainty uh, through the process. And, and therefore, you know, this bill is not what some people um, might have liked it to be in terms of being a huge departure um, from the rules that we've uh, worked under previously, it is very much focused on providing that certainty and continuity through the process. So I think there has been a, a high degree of engagement. Of course, you're right to say there are a very large number of amendments. Um, and we the reason why we have uh, such a long committee stage with eight days in committee and eight hours guaranteed for each day is because we want to have the opportunity to properly and fully respond to those. And I uh, recognise that um, there's been some, some of those amendments have been very carefully drafted. It is worth pointing out, of course, that a lot of the large numbers of amendments are because there are consequential amendments on some of the key ones which then have effect in different parts of the bill. So when we talk about the devolution area, um, a large number of the amendments are consequential amendments clause 10 or 11, um, which, which then pick up in, uh, the, the detail in the, the, the schedules. Um, but I think with regard to scrutiny, we have to strike a, a balance. We want to make sure that um, everything, all the devolved legislation, or sorry, delegated legislation under the bill um, can be properly scrutinised. And of course, there are procedures in place to do that. But we also do need to make clear that there are a very large number of technical changes which need to be got through uh, in the time we have available. So the statute book works in time. Um, for exit. Uh, and this is where I think it's so important that you know, we focus on getting the, the workload done. I think that's something which is in the interests of um, each part of the United Kingdom. We will look very carefully at all the suggestions for scrutiny procedures, but we do need to make sure that there are scrutiny procedures that enable the workload to be got through uh, in time for our exit. Uh, and and that's, what, that's what one of the mechanisms by which we'll be judging them. I think in terms of 
engagement to date since between the 9th of August and I think the 24th of October on my list here when it comes to UK government engagement both at official level and um, officials talking with either Scottish government, Scottish Parliament or Scotland MPs or with ministers having those discussions I can count 14 separate occasions and I'm very keen to ensure that there is further engagement and certainly my door is open to any Scottish MPs who wish to, um, to have discuss the bill uh, with me and I'm you know, have had met with Tommy Shepherd twice, uh, Stephen Gethins once to discuss opposition amendments, and I hope you know to meet with anyone who has uh, any issues you know with the bill going forwards. But the wider point around scrutiny once the bill is in place, and obviously we were seeking you know legislative consent motion for the scrutiny arrangements of the bill, um, and that's why we've explicitly, specifically provided for it to be within the legislative competence of the Scottish Parliament to change those arrangements, just as it is for other powers of the Scottish Ministers, because that's in the Scotland Act. You know, at the moment, the scrutiny uh, arrangements are simply the equivalent scrutiny procedures that apply in the devolved legislatures as they apply in the UK Parliament. But as is normal practice, uh, we've invited comments from the Scottish Government on their views of the appropriateness of the current scrutiny arrangements in this bill. We respect the responsibility of the devolved legislators that they have for how to scrutinise subordinate legislation made by the relevant devolved authorities. And we remain open to suggestions and thoughts on how to ensure the bill works in delivering a function in the statute book, including the scrutiny procedures. So very much welcome any future engagement. It's helpful to know that there's lots of conversations taking place mm -hmm. uh, between different parliamentarians and ministers. But what I was thinking um, more about in my question is some of the, the stakeholders from outside of Parliament, including some environmental organisations that we heard from in this committee just recently. And uh, whilst certainty and, and continuity is quite a, a nice strap line, I don't think many of those organisations feel that they, they have certainty in terms of their areas of interest. So, um, again, to go back to, to the question, if the super affirmative procedure is not something the government is, the UK government is considering, um, how else do you propose to address these very real concerns from these stakeholders and other uh, politicians that might share those views in, in their behalf? Well, I think we've um, made a number of commitments publicly uh, around you know, the UK government's position, but we want to be the greenest government ever. We want to leave the environment in a better state than we inherited it. And in terms of our commitments, both international commitments and our um, existing commitments on the environment, um, and certainly recognise the importance of um, the environmental stakeholders in that space. I've been meeting with many of them. My Secretary of State has also been um, meeting with many of them. I know that you've taken evidence from the RSPB in Scotland. We've had a number of meetings. Um, with them. Uh, clearly, this is an area where we have um, to make sure we're taking an approach in the bill, which preserves the existing body of environmental law, which it absolutely does. But we also have to look at what is um, policy more broadly. Uh, and as my, my colleague Steve Baker said to the exiting the EU committee in this respect, you know, this is also uh, where there's very important work going on um, in Bayes and in DEFRA to look at uh, UK policy uh, going forward. Um, just to I'm sorry if I'm, I'm getting boring in repeating this, but to return to the basic point of the bill, it is not about making changes in these spaces. It is about um, writing into place the existing arrangements and, and protecting those as we exit the European Union. Um, and, and that is, uh, you know, I, I, I think, the crucial thing when it comes to our environmental commitments. You'll see under Clause 8, there is um, there are powers to um, make sure that we keep up our commitments to international agreements. Those can, it would include uh, a number of international environmental commitments, and it's very important important, but we do absolutely protect those uh, as we go through this process. But what we have said to NGOs is if they have specific concerns, we want to hear directly from them, and that we will um, absolutely ensure that we respond to those. Thank you. Um, Brexit is many things, but boring uh, isn't, isn't one of them. <laughs> um, I think we all agree the importance of um, UK ministers and Scottish ministers and, of course, officials all working together and having lots of dialogue. Um, but I think a point has been made to us is that there, there is a potential for overlap and sequencing um, issues uh, can arise too. So I wonder, is there an intention, an intention to establish a cross-administration steering group? I think the current uh, process of intergovernment relations is clearly being led through the JMCN process and having had that concordiat agreed on the 16th of October, you know, that is stepping up the level of engagement, both in terms of the quantity of engagement and also the frequency of engagement. There will be obviously another uh, meeting of the JMCN um, that will be taking place 
in December, and you know, these processes are the processes that have been established and, and are well used by which engagement uh, takes place. Okay, I, I don't think I was actually that clear. I, I was meaning in relation to secondary legislation. Um, I wonder if there would be a, a cross uh, administration steering group in that respect. Is that something that you think could be? Useful? Well, I think I can only re, you know, state mm -hmm. uh, my willingness and the UK government's willingness to listen uh, to the uh, Scottish government and the Scottish Parliament in terms of the appropriateness of scrutiny arrangements when it comes to the bill. And we respect, you know, the responsibility and we've given the powers within the bill that for a later stage, obviously, uh, it's within the legislative competence of the Scottish Parliament to change those arrangements. But we want to be in a space where we are listening to ideas uh, that reflect, um, you know, the concerns that are raised both by the Scottish Government and by parliamentarians such as yourself. I just add, you know, I think we're very keen to work constructively throughout this process to make sure that we have a, a system in place that delivers for each of the um, governments and the devolved administrations. I think you know, getting the statute books right in time for exit is a, is a very important duty on all of us. And so therefore coordinating the way in which we work on that um, w would be welcome. Uh, of course, all of that requires this bill to move forward. Uh, and that is something that we need to make sure we are enabling um, through all the, um, the processes at hand. Sure. Uh, I'll just jump in there, Monica, because uh, it's the same. You're the convener? I, I am indeed. Um, same subject. Um, just thinking out loud about this uh, sort of steering group idea. Um, as you know, Mr. Walker, I, ca I came down to the, the Lords uh, for a, a meeting of parliamentarians from um, all the devolved nations. Um, uh, I'm also myself and the deputy convener are, are meeting members of the Public Administration and Constitutional Affairs Committee tomorrow. Um, so there is dialogue between parliamentarians. I wonder if there's a you know, merit in uh, making that more formal, because it's informal at the moment. I think you know, formal and informal mechanisms both have their place, and um, they, they, they they both have their value. Um, I think it's important, and I think you know, I, I, I mentioned before, our focus through this process is making sure that we get the statute book into the right shape for exiting the European Union. Um, I think it's important in that that we, we don't think that we are aiming to rewrite the rules of the UK constitutional settlement. But of course we have to constantly look at how we can make sure that the, um, uh, the arrangements between us um, work better and work properly. And so if, if there are ways of doing that, um, we should be exploring them. Okay, thank you. Do you, do you have a final question, Monica? Um, I do, yeah, I appreciate that we're probably watching the clock now and it's all a race against time, I, I can see that, but there's going to be a huge amount of information, so I wonder what you're able to say about what the UK government will do to um, to share um, with us, you know, in an early stage now, about the preparations for the volume and flow of statutory uh, instruments, um, when can we expect to get some information on that? I think that's a, that's a good question, which I think we'll have to look into in terms of when those um, statutory instruments have been enabled by the bill, the, the best process to deal with that. Obviously, we are looking um, at the appropriate mechanisms with the UK Parliament for managing um, the, the, the volume of statutory instruments that we're talking about, and it is a substantial volume. Um, but it is also, um, it, as you'll appreciate, under existing arrangements, we have very large numbers of statutory instruments, not least uh, under the 2-2 powers under the European Communities Act. And so this is something that um, the, the arrangements are used to handling um, a certain amount of um, delegated legislation. Um, and you know, again, I think it, in terms of the approach we take to the delegated legislation under this bill, um, it may be that as we move forward, we'll, we'll want to, to, to find new mechanisms for communicating on that. But it, it's something that I think we'd have to make sure that we um, establish the approach with the UK Parliament first um, and then follow up on. Okay. And going forward, what information do you think you'll be in a position to share with devolved legislators on forthcoming uh, statutory instruments which amend domestic legislation in areas of devolved competence? I think, understandably, we're actively engaging with the Scottish Government to discuss how best to deliver the secretary legislation required for exit and a behind the scenes with officials building up that shared understanding with devolved administrations of where those corrections to the statute books 
will be needed. Obviously, the Scottish Government's best place to assess their capacity and necessary resourcing in order to make all of the secondary legislation required to prepare the statute book for exit. Obviously, we, you know, we have that commitment integral in the bill that we believe that when it comes to correcting deficiencies, the the administrations, the involved administrations, the Scottish Government you know, are best placed to be able to know where those deficiencies are. But we want to, to work together and, you know, already you know, we work together frequently on ensuring that when it comes to statutory instruments, secondary legislation affecting different nations in the UK, um, you know, we have, as Minister Walker said, you know, powers that are modelled currently on the um, Section 2.2 of the European Communities Act, and we'll just see a continuation of those working practices. And obviously the volume that will be needed to be, to be assessed of uh, statutory uh, instruments obviously, you know, will be significant and we want to understand, you know, where uh, the Scottish Government will need uh, assistance where possible. But we're determined to ensure that we work at this together because, you know, it's a significant volume of legislation that requires deficiencies to be corrected. Many of those will obviously be technical corrections and there may be a process by which, you know, technical amendments can be sifted faster. But, um, you know, this is a, something that engagement has already begun. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Skidmore, I think you probably deserve a medal if you've had uh, two meetings with Tommy Shepherd. <laughs> oh, um, well, <laughs> well, he's he's my counterpart, so we cover oh. all constitutional affairs. So I am in regular, um, not as we've had very constructive dialogue behind the scenes. Obviously, when it comes to the floor of the House or Westminster Hall debates on other matters of constitutional uh, theory, we may differ yeah. in um, the UK government's position to the uh, Scottish National Party's own position, but you know. I'm determined to ensure that we can work together because I believe, and I Good. think Mr Shepherd would believe it's all in our common interests of our constituents that we do so. I'm sure he does. Um, so we've got no further questions. Um, I thank you very much for your time uh, today. Um, we'll be reporting by the end of next week. Uh, we'll make sure you get that report. Um, be interested in your response to it, of course. Um, as I said earlier, that will probably be the first of a number of reports, um, I, I just yeah. Hopefully, you'll be prepared to come back at some point. If diaries allow, I'd be very yeah. happy to come back, and uh, that, I think that, it's important. That'd be great. We, yeah. Okay, so I'll suspend the meeting briefly to uh, allow you guys to get on with your day. Thank you. Okay, um, agenda item three, instruments subject to affirmative procedure. Um, no points have been raised by our legal advisers on the following draft instruments. The Registers of Scotland Digital Registration, etc. Regulations 2017, the Land Registration Scotland Act 2012 Amendment Order 2017, the Public Records Scotland Act 2011, Authorities Amendment Order 2018, the First Tier Tribunal for Scotland, Transfer of Functions of the Additional Support Needs Tribunal for Scotland, Regulations 2018, the First Tier Tribunal for Scotland, Transfer of Functions of the Scottish Charity Appeals Panel, Regulations 2018, the First Tier Tribunal for Scotland, Health and Education, Chamber and Upper Tribunal for Scotland, Composition Regulations 2018, 
the Criminal Justice Scotland Act 2016, modification of Part 1 and Ancillary Provision Regulations 2017, and the Criminal Justice Scotland Act 2016, Consequential and Supplementary Modifications Regulations 2017. Is the committee content with these instruments? Thank you. Agenda item four, instruments subject to negative procedure. Uh, the first tier tribunal for Scotland housing and property chamber procedure regulations, SSI 2017-328. The Tribunal Scotland Act 2014, under which these regulations are made, created a new structure for, for tribunals dealing with devolved matters and provided for a first tier tribunal and an upper tribunal. Within that structure, the first tier tribunal has been divided into chambers according to subject matter. One of these is the housing and property chamber. These regulations make provision for the rules of procedure for that first tier tribunal. Our legal advisers have drawn our attention to 10 errors within these regulations. Three of the errors are recommended for reporting on significant grounds. The committee may wish to comment that while it notes the explanation given for each of the errors in the Scottish Government's response, it's highly unsatisfactory for the instrument to have been laid before the Parliament in its present form. The committee's role is not to provide a substitute for internal checking by the relevant Scottish Government department. It's worth noting that the Government has already responded to the questions raised by our legal advisers by laying an amending instrument. I should also wish to point out the committee expressed considerable concern about the last package of instruments relating to tribunals, and in that context it's very disappointing that an improvement has not been made. We've only just been discussing the likelihood of a substantial increase in statutory instruments I urge the government to examine its quality control procedures to avoid laying instruments containing so many errors in the future. I'll now set out where our legal advisers considered that there are errors in the rules contained in the schedule to this instrument to which the committee may wish to draw the attention of the parliament. On reporting ground E, as there appears to be a doubt as to whether Rule 37.3a is intra viris, that is, within the scope of powers contained in the Parent Tribunal Scotland Act 2014. In particular, Rule 37.3a appears to preclude an appeal permitted by Section 46.1 of the 2014 Act in relation to a decision arising from a re-decided matter made by the First Tier Tribunal on review. On reporting ground I, as the instrument appears to be defectively drafted in the following two respects. Firstly, Rule 86 refers to the lesser making an application under Section 76 of the Rent Scotland Act 1984 and also requires that the application must be signed and dated by the lesser or a representative of the lessee. However, as applications under 70, Section 76 are made by the lessee, those references to lesser should be lessee. Seems a basic point. Secondly, Rule 106A, 4 and 5 do not make pr provision in relation to applications made by landlords under Section 14.2 of the Private Housing Tenancy Scotland Act 2016. On reporting ground H, as the meaning of the instrument could be clearer in the following three respects. Firstly, the term assured tenancy, reference to the first tier tribunal in Rule 1.1, could, could more clearly align to the words assured tenancy reference used in the remainder of the schedule. Secondly, it could be clearer in Rule 10.4, that anything permitted or required under a practice direction or order may be done by a lay representative on behalf of a party. Thirdly, in Rules 44.4 and 53.4, it could be clearer that sufficient notice of an inspection should be given in writing by the first tier tribunal to both parties 
rather than the party. On general reporting ground, uh, the general reporting ground in respect of the following four issues. Firstly, subparagraph F of the list in Rule 43.1 unnecessarily duplicates the requirement in Section 17.2 of the Property Factors Scotland Act 2011, which is already referred to in Rule 43.1. Secondly, the reference to in Rule 69 to an application under Section 36 6A or 6B of the Housing Scotland Act 1988 is incorrect. Thirdly, Rule 92G in Chapter 8 of the Schedule appears to be unnecessary insofar as it refers to an application made under Section 92.2 of the Rent Scotland Act 1984 in circumstances where Chapter 8 does not make substantive provision in relation to that section. Fourthly, the requirements in Rules 97.1 and 97.2 for the first tier tribunal to notify both parties in relation to the variation or revocation of a letting agent enforcement order is inconsistent with Rule 96C, which refers to more than two parties. And I bet members are just grateful they're not sitting in my place having to read all these mistakes out. Does the committee wish to draw the instrument to the attention of the Parliament on these grounds? Thank you. Does the committee wish to welcome that the Scottish Government agree to make an amending instrument addressing these points? Okay. Moving on, uh, on to the other instruments, no points have been raised by our legal advisers on SSI 2017 347, 348, 349, 350, 353, 355, 356 and 367. Is the committee content with these instruments? Agenda okay. item 5. Um, instruments not subject to any parliamentary procedure. No points have been raised by our legal advisers on SSI 2017-345-C25, 346-C26 and 352-C27. Is the committee content with these instruments? Yes. Okay. In relation to SSI 346, does the committee uh, wish to welcome that the Scottish Government has revoked and replaced the Private Housing Tenancy Scotland Act 2016, Commencement Number 2 and Saving Provision uh, Regulations 2017, which meets the commitment given to the committee in relation to that earlier instrument? Thank you. Agenda item six, Housing Amendment Scotland Bill. Uh, this is an opportunity to identify matters which the committee may wish to raise with the Scottish Government in relation to delegated powers contained in this bill. The purpose of the bill is to ensure that the influence which the Scottish housing regulator and local authorities can exercise over registered social landlords, uh, RSLs, is compat compatible with RSLs being classified by the Office uh, for National Statistics, ONS, as private sector bodies in the UK's national accounts. Uh, there are a number of delegated powers in the bill. Our legal advisers have suggested that the following questions could be raised in written correspondence with the Scottish Government. Question one, in relation to section eight, the delegated powers memorandum indicates that the Scottish Government intends to use the power in this section only for the purpose of providing the ONS with the basis for classifying RSLs as private sector bodies in the national accounts if the bill, when enacted, does not achieve that. However, Section 8.1 enables the modification of the functions of the Scottish Housing Regulator, which relates to social landlords, which does not limit the powers by reference to the purpose or aim of securing the reclassification of RSLs to the private sector in the national accounts. Section 82A also expressly enables different provision for different purposes. Does the committee wish to ask the Scottish Government for an explanation as to why it has considered it appropriate to draw the scope of the power in Section 8, 1 and 2 in that more general way, or whether the power could be drawn more narrowly 
while at the same time implementing the policy intentions. Okay. Question two, the delegated powers memorandum indicates that the power in section eight uh, would only be used for the purpose of providing the ONS with the basis for classifying RSLs as private sector bodies. Does the committee wish to ask the Scottish Government for an explanation as to why it is appropriate that Section 8.1 enables the modification of the functions of the regulator which relate to social landlords, which includes local authority landlords and local authorities providing house, housing services, in addition to registered social landlords? May it also be asked how it is anticipated that the power would be used in relation to social landlords apart from registered social landlords. Okay. And question three, uh, the delegated powers memorandum indicates how specifically the Scottish Government intends to use the power in section nine. In the first instance, it intends to specify in regulations that local authorities may only nominate up to a maximum of 24% of the board members of an RSL and may not exercise control over RSLs for example, through a power to veto changes in an RSL's constitution. The Scottish Government intends to use the power subsequently if other forms of local authority control that amount to public sector control over RSLs come to light, or if the cr criteria the ONS applies to determine public sector control changes and such changes require the powers of local authorities to be amended further <coughs> to ensure that RSLs can continue to be classified to the private sector. However, Section 9.1 enables any provisions for the purpose of limiting or removing the ability of local authorities to exert influence over RSLs through A, appointing or removing officers of RSLs, and B, exercising or controlling voting rights. Section 95A also enables different provisions for different purposes. Similarly to the powers in Section 8, the powers are not limited by reference to the purpose or aim of securing the reclassification of RSLs to the private sector in the national accounts. So does the committee wish to ask the Sc Scottish Government for an explanation as to why it is considered appropriate to draw the scope of the powers in Section 9 in that more general way, or whether the powers could be drawn more narrowly while at the same time implementing the policy intentions. May it also be asked, sorry, that one? Thank you. Um, may it also be asked why it has been considered not appropriate to set out the initial intentions for the exercise of the power on the face of the bill, that is that the regulations may specify that local authorities may nominate up to a maximum of 24% of the board members of an RSL and may not exercise forms of control over RSLs, such as the power to veto changes in an RSL's constitution. Okay, I now move the committee into private session.